Focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable. Phone Pay Pulse, Beat of Progress, powered by Money Control. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Beat of Progress, a series of in-depth podcast-style conversations powered by Phone Pay Pulse. I'm your host, Karthik Raghupati, and I lead corporate strategy and investor relations at Phone Pay. Phone Pay Pulse recently collaborated with the Boston Consulting Group, BCG, to release a definitive report on the Indian digital payments market which is expected to reach $10 trillion by 2026. And on that note, I am delighted to welcome Samir Nigam, co-founder and CEO of PhonePay. Welcome, Samir. Glad to have you here with us. Thanks, Karthik. And very excited to be here. Very excited to see the first BCG Pulse report. So, Samir, let me start with uh, Pulse. Uh, I think it's a very unique initiative that's been undertaken by PhonePay. Take us through what led to its creation. Why did phone pay pulse really happen? The germ of the idea was that we've been beneficiaries of a lot of public private collaboration platform initiatives, UPI obviously being the largest of them, but we're beneficiaries of an ecosystem that's really unique in many ways. The world's talking about web 3.0 and decentralized systems. But in India, if you look at the last 10, 15 years, especially in our industry, from an Aadhaar enable systems, UPI, BBPS, um, FastTag, RTGS, RTGS and NEFT APIs. Um, there is so much that the ecosystem and the government machinery and the regulatory frameworks have given us that allow us to scale this much. We felt that it was important as the market leader today to give back in equal measure. And one of the things that we found when we were starting out was there was very little data available uh, both macro indicators as well as sort of district level information about what the penetration levels of digital payments are, what the consumer habits are, what the merchant habits are. Um, and so about a year back, we started talking about, okay, now that we are processing billions of transactions every month, could we in fact harness all of that data in a highly sort of anonymized and secure way, but unleash the power of information for the entire market, for academia, for think tanks, for policymakers, and and that's where the idea of Pulse came about. And personally, very very proud of the team. It, it took a lot of people across functions to collaborate and get this out in a compliant manner. Absolutely, uh, and I think one of the flagship products seems to be what's been recently launched, uh, which is the digital payments report that came out uh, recently. So, from your vantage point, Samir, what are some of the key highlights? What stuck out for you the most when you read through this report? To be honest, uh, six years into this industry, every year when I look at the data, I think the one thing that just stands out is how fast digital payments is becoming sort of all pervasive in society, and yet how much of a sort of greenfield opportunity there still is. It's maybe about 250, 300 million people who adopted digital payments as a lifestyle today, especially post COVID. Um, but then that just also means that there's another six, 700 million Indians still to be onboarded, still to be educated, still to be marketed to and, and um, brought onto the digital bandwagon. So it's, it's still early innings, yet the scales become really, really massive and exciting. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the history, Samir. Uh, in the report, we've talked about the 10 trillion opportunity that we are set to achieve by 2026. But you have personally uh, seen digital payments and UPI in particular grow from scratch. I'm sure you're asked this question often, but I actually think this question never gets stale. Uh, what in your view are some of the pivotal moments or innovations that have really driven such unprecedented adoption amongst Indians? I think the, while well, well, the UPI story is well documented, I think the journey to be fair, started with the regulator um, opening up digital wallet licenses more liberally in the early 2010s. Um, we saw the first wave of adoption happening for online use cases, um, particularly things like taxi cab bookings and, and regular food tech uh, use cases. Um, and the first set of sort of household brands in urban India at that time um, emerged from there. Um, I think the single biggest change has obviously been the advent of UPI in 2016. Um, remains the first of its kind worldwide and possibly still the only one of its kind worldwide where 
all banks in the country uh, have adopted um, a technology stack that's fully interoperable. They've put peer-to-peer -peer online and offline transactions within reach of any consumer with a mobile phone with no other infrastructure requirement. Um, the regulator backed it to the hilt, the government's backed it to the hilt. So that's really been, and obviously, I mean, the, the industry is just, uh, players like ourselves wouldn't have existed if you, the UPI moment had not happened. So I think, I think there's an entire sort of public-private collaboration machinery that's gone behind this. Um, that was the single biggest one. Um, then, of course, there's, there's serendipity. There's, there's things that you don't plan for. Um, demonetization was a big one. Obviously, no individual industry player or, or fintech player or bank could have planned that. Uh, but when demonetization happened, money transfer became really difficult for a few months. And UPI had just launched and became sort of uh, got very, very early adoption. Uh, 10 million users in the first couple of months after Demon. Um, money can't buy that kind of adoption curve. Um, and then again, um, fast tag at every toll station on every national highway becoming mandatory gave another impetus. Uh, Adhar enable payments for, uh, especially for folks in rural India. Um, that's now reached about a billion transactions a month, I believe, or, or more. Uh, so there's been different solutions for different sectors, and each of them has given a massive boost. When you combine all of that um, with, the, with the COVID impact and people's reluctance to use cash or exchange anything uh, manually, um, the offline payment transaction boom was the last sort of, or second last frontier, I would say. Um, so at this stage, I think it's fair to say in all walks of life, whether it's online payments, delivery payments, store payments, money transfers, salary payments, um, we have solutions and we have multiple instruments, not just UPI, but there's Rupa and Visa and MasterCard and the card networks, there's 30 odd wallets. So I think, I think consumers have a lot of choice. Consumers have fantastic rails that have been designed for scale um, in by, by um, public or, or quasi public companies. Um, I'd say the only, only use case at scale that has not really been digitized completely yet as far as payments is concerned is probably transportation that's great Samir. so i actually want to pick up from what you just talked about you talked about use cases you talked about instruments but i just want to pivot to more forward-looking drivers now and let's start with use cases so you've talked about money transfers um, you know fast tag as well as toll and then uh, bill payments how do you envision expansion of digital payments and UPI from a use case perspective. You obviously talked about transportation. Is there anything else that you think is left unconquered for digital payments? So um, in terms of UPI itself, there's a couple of things that need to be done to make it available to every Indian as opposed to only those that have smartphones. Uh, there's work happening on that. But in terms of core use cases, as I mentioned, transportation, your daily transit, buses and rickshaws and um, trains and, and airports. I don't think I don't think digitization has reached the level that it should have. There are certain structural issues. There are certain just reach issues, but the industry is working through them. Um, in terms of core use cases of UPI, unlike the card networks, where both debit and credit flow equally through all, all the main networks, uh, the same is not true on UPI today. Uh, we should we should figure out ways as an industry to leverage the UPI rails and, and mass adoption to let credit flow freely as well. Uh, Visa, MasterCard have done a much better job globally in terms of having both credit cards and debit card adoption become ubiquitous in a lot of societies. Um, and I'd say that the other dimension to look at is we are still largely talking about retail con consumer retail payments. Um, there's a whole supply chain on the on the small business side, their suppliers, their distributors, and obviously the entire B2B payment side, where there's still room for a lot of innovation. The question I was going to ask you, which is about how do you see the instrument world evolving, right? We, we have credit and debit cards, we've got NEFT, RTGS, and of course, UPI. So do you envision a world where, you know, these start to connect to each other, where UPI, for example, then also seamlessly merges into higher ticket size transactions like RTGS? I think they'll, they will merge at different points. Uh, again, if you see the, the global networks, the, especially the, the two big ones, Visa and MasterCard, 
or even actually if you include Amex and others over time globally, the network bin series became sort of uh, universal. You could use any card at any POS device pretty much anywhere in the world. Um, so there was, there was loose sort of interoperability there. UPI is interoperable by design. Um, I think, I think there'll be a couple of things that'll happen. Cards, because tokenization has now come in, uh, and there I actually must sort of applaud the RBI for insisting on it. Um, a lot of the risk with online payments will go down, even though we didn't like two-factor authentication five, 10 years ago. It gives a new to digital market consumer a lot of comfort. Tokenization should boost that further. Once you have tokenization um, at the merchant level, my hope is that the authentication will shift to the mobile devices. I think where the cards are lagging today compared to UPI, UPI is designed for the mobile phone. Cards were designed for a web era or physical POS world. Um, I, think, I think the card networks will bounce back in the next three or four years. Once they're able to actually get one touch payments going with a risk-based framework using device fingerprints and other technology that's available today, um, I think, I think you will start seeing different types of networks competing more. Um, still waiting and watching to see how the whole sort of new NUE licenses play out. Uh, RBI has taken a bunch of applications that said they're reviewing those. So there could be new ad, uh, networks that come out in India. I don't know. Um, yeah. it's, it's exciting times across the board. I, I can't say I can predict the future. None of us saw what happened. None of us saw what happened in the last five years coming at us. It, it's just been spectacular. Agree. Uh, just one last thing on the innovation side and specifically on UPI. There's just a lot in the pipeline when it comes to product innovation, right? There's UPI Lite. Uh, you mentioned UPI for feature phones. There's Aadhaar enabled onboarding for UPI. There's UPI going international. Which of these are you most excited about specifically for UPI? <laughs> That's a trick question. I'm, I'm terribly excited about each one of them. It's really, uh, it's one of the hardest uh, things to prioritize on because on the one hand, you're talking about made in India, technology stack going global, and, and that would be really, uh, truly the first of its kind. So as, as market leaders today, we would absolutely want to go international with UPI. Um, I think COVID actually was a bit of a dampen in terms of travel and setting things up, but we'd like to go there. Um, on the other side, at a mission level for us, uh, we're very clear that we build for India first and primarily. Um, and UPI for feature phones is a very, very important uh, step in that direction because there are still about 300 million people who are still on feature phones and it's not churning fast enough. So instead of waiting eight to 10 years for everyone to migrate to smartphones, I think the better thing to do was uh, solve for the feature phone. So UPI one, two, three, I think sets the game in motion. Uh, UPI Aadhaar is actually the most immediate uh, win, I would say. There are maybe about a hundred odd million people who have adopted UPI apps, but have largely remained on the receiving side till date. Uh, either because they didn't have a debit card handy or they've not activated a debit card with an ATM pin. Uh, those are the two things you need to onboard yourself as a sender or, or spender of money on UPI today. Uh, very, very vast majority of these users would have an Aadhaar card and understand how to do EKYC. Uh, so when UPI Aadhaar comes along, we expect the conversion of users on UPI apps to spenders and senders on UPI apps to actually explode. Um, so I think, I think one expands the reach of the market, which is UPI feature phone, UPI Aadhaar improves the conversion of those who are trying the adopters and UPI international, of course, is just a completely, completely, uh, incredible opportunity. And, and I think India should do everything and we should as ecosystem players do everything to expand as fast as we can. I want to switch gears a bit and, uh, talk a little bit about, you know, adjacent spaces where a similar approach would work. So. Uh, the UPI model at its core is essentially an interoperable, decentralized, secure protocol driven system and is essentially what is now being referred to as Web3. So to be honest, UPI's democratized model was launched and implemented at scale much before Web3 became a buzzword. So in India, beyond payments, where else do you think we can expect such transformative, scalable ecosystems with a similar approach? For example, there's talk on commerce via ONDC, there's lending via 
OCE and and uh, account aggregator. There's the health stack. So, which of these spaces do you think a similar approach could work? And you know, where are you bullish? I'm I'm bullish on pretty much every one of the initiatives you mentioned uh, for different reasons. Uh, I think I think UPI is a central platform built at scale. It's async. It it allows every bank to integrate and and innovation to thrive at the application layer. Um, account aggregator is a very different approach where the regulator is given licenses to several entities, including a phone pay via licensee. Um, so you have many NPCI like players acting as account aggregator hubs, and then you have all the financial information users. So it's the, instead of a central backbone, it's a more decentralized model where you have multiple players from get go. Um, ONDC is an interoperable network layer. It's it's an open source initiative, uh, source code initiative, uh, but it's not a managed solution. So it's a very different solution. And again, I think the right choice because in commerce, um, the engagement has to be between the buyer and the seller, and ultimately the consumer and the seller. Um, and it'll be category specific. It'll evolve at a different pace altogether. Um, so what's I think what's most novel here is the government and various regulators are taking a different approach to different sectors. Um, in ONDC, you don't need a license like an account aggregator to play. Any buyer platform can play or any any e-commerce company can engage with any set of seller platforms. Um, if I look a little further, if I look at health stack and uh, maybe even ed stack, I think Xstep is doing some fantastic work there. Um, we are now entering a world where every page on every published school book is starting to carry mini QR codes that you can scan and get more information and more context. So you could be reading a history book in the fifth grade and you want to learn more and a kid on a smartphone can scan that QR, get that topic and, and get more results around it. Um, so I think, I think there's tsunami of change that's going to be unleashed in ed tech. Uh, health tech, again, we've seen two incredible applications already. Uh, and I'm not going into sort of the, the uh, early privacy issues. There are always some when you start out. It's some could have been avoided or not. Doesn't really matter. The fact of the matter is, if you look at Arogya Setu when you look at COVID, um, one application provided a track and trace at a population level that we as Indians could not have imagined five years ago. And I think I think the one part that is non-controversial um, is that it, it probably saved millions of lives, or at least millions of COVID uh, cases happening in the country. And with COVID in record time, the government's managed to make sure that we are able to uniquely trace how many Indians have got vaccinated, send them timely reminders and make sure that all Indians got their two sort of mandatory or, or required vaccinations. And now we are also talking about boosters. Um, these things could not have happened without technology, but more importantly, these things could not have happened without very active and triangulated work between government entities and regulators in, in certain cases, the private industry. And um, I think I think entities like India Stack and people who are collaborating on Health Stack and bodies like Beckin, um, who are really in the public-private collaboration space. These are volunteer-led networks. Um, it's a very, very unique model I wouldn't even call it Web 3.0. It's it's more like uh, in Nandan Lakeney recently called it Web 4.0. It is really the best of all worlds where all parties and all stakeholders are collaborating freely. And yet there's room for everyone sort of challenging each other's positions on things like consent and privacy and, and data custodianship and data security. So a lot of, lot of rich debate happening. I, I think I'm personally excited about just the the sectors that you mentioned, right, whether it's financial services, commerce, education, healthcare, these are foundation, I mean, foundations of an economy, let alone a digital economy. And I think the ability for technology and this whole public private partnership to contribute to India's overall economy across all of these foundational sectors, I think is just immense. I think on that note, I'd like to end, but I'll, I'll end by bringing back Pulse. Um, it's an open data platform. And of this scale, I think it's the first in the ecosystem. How do you see Pulse evolving from here? And how do you see this benefiting, say, other players in the ecosystem? Uh, I, I think in terms of just the amount of data available and the, the various cuts of data available, um, I, I think 
we've again not really scratched the surface in terms of unleashing people's imagination. Um, my hope um, for Pulse in in a couple of different on a couple of different axes. I think for a lot of the policymakers, there has been a concerted effort to drive up digitization, not just of payments, but digital payments, uh, financial services, and beyond. Um, at a district level, at a state level, at a central level. And I'm hopeful that um, we will do our part, and I, I know you and your team are instrumental in doing that, Karthik, um, engaging with, with the right government authorities and, again, the respective regulators, making them aware that such a data source is there. And I, I believe at 45% plus of market share, it is truly representative of the data at scale as well. And therefore, people can make informed choices about where the penetration is low, uh, focus on those areas, drive awareness campaigns in a way that only the government can, uh, districts can. The one that I'm actually really excited about, and hopefully it happens, is um, college kids, early graduates, people people who actually want to launch new startups, looking at ventures. This data is really for them. We didn't have this data. If we knew where the green spaces were, uh, if we had access to that data, again, on a heat map that easily, we would have found places. Samir, thank you so much for joining us on this inaugural Beat of Progress. It's been a pleasure. Folks, watch out for more such riveting chats with leaders who are shaping India's digital future. Phone Pay Pulse, Beat of Progress, powered by Money Control. Focus. Ideate. Innovate. Enable.